Oh, the anticipation for that was just waiting for that to <laughs> down was too much. It oh wait, this... we're live. Woo! We are here for the <laughs> annual Christmas episode of This Week in Science, broadcasting live via StreamYard. Oh, I guess I get a lollipop. Lollipop for you. Ooh, wow, delicious. we're Christmas. Merry Christmas, says oh, Kai. Hello. Okay, go to bed. I love you. Take your lollipop and leave. <laughs> Say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I had a nickel for every time. <laughs> oh, thank you. I get a lollipop. Okay. Have a good night. All right, everybody. We're here to do a show. La, la, la. A show about science. This is the live broadcast of the Twist podcast. We're going to do it all right now and talk about science because that's what we like to do. There might be things cut out, but we don't have a blare tonight, so maybe it'll just hit that tight 90 like we like to try to hit. Tight 90. Tight 90. <laughs> Justin's like, I'm not even trying. I'm not even I don't even try. know. I don't even know how that works. Well, actually, uh, yeah, without Blairla, though, you're right. It might speed up the show quite a bit. Maybe. Because all Maybe. the parts where she's talking it won't be there. So how could it not be quicker? Is that what you're saying? How could it not be? Move your microphone a little closer to yourself. It's uh, you it's got to be a level thing or something because this is like I'm almost eating this mic. I, I really so like it when you're up closer to it. Yeah, but I know yeah. you. I so like know. this. I'd have to do the show like this. And then I don't have to kind of whisper. Because otherwise it would be too loud probably. I don't want you whispering, but you're like 12 feet away from it. No, anyway. it's right. It's literally right here. It's six inches away. I know. For I Christmas, ate. I need to get you a mic stand so you can position it next to your face. All right. Like, like this? I could just do it like that. Like that, like a radio show style. <laughs> Not going to work. Okay, everyone. Let's do this podcast thingamajigamajuggy thing. Let's make it happen. And. Yeah. You ready? Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Yes. I know I can turn up the recording volume. I can maybe. Yeah. But if I turn him up too much, then when he yells, then it's too loud later. So Well, the, 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 you got to take it. You got to take the the uh the overs. <laughs> no. Got to take the overs. Get your get your you get your mic skills. Get get, get all the mic skills. On there. Okay. Let's do this program right now. We're going to start this. You ready? I'm ready. We're ready. In a three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 855, recorded on Wednesday, December 15th, 2021. Bringing Twistmas cheer with science. It's what we like to do. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with organs and mammals and Twistmasy stuff. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Well, maybe you've been to school for a year or two and think you've seen it all. What you really need is a holiday in science. Yes, it's beginning to sound a lot like Twistmas. Intro to the show. A pair of NASA probes from the row that rose. Oh, gosh, that's a different. I knew this was not going to work. Okay. And right, you can try that again. Let's try that again. Out. This is what this edits is are for. I knew this wasn't going to work, though, because it's, uh, it's it, on paper, it looked like I was going to be able to pull it off. But in reality, it's a medley, which is not a thing I know how to do. Okay. It's beginning to sound a lot like Twistmas. Intro to the show. A pair of NASA probes in a rover that robes is the wish of Barney and Jen. A robot that walks and goes for a talk is the hope of Janice and Ben. She's a... But then it stops and, uh, and it does a different one. And it's uh, such beautiful sight, happy tonight, talking in a science wonderland. And then it's a different song it hops into. As we hoop de do and decorate dark into the holiday season. That's even another one with science stories coming around. Then we're going to switch again 
We want to wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. And a happy, happy New Year. Year. Before we are off, dashing through the snow in a science podcast sleigh, on the air we go with this week in science all the way. Coming up next. Oh, and it's going to get edited out. I hope. I hope. Should edit that entire. entire yeah, anyway, we, we we just get rid of that disclaimer altogether. It just oh, it I loved good. it. I'm, what I'm gonna, what I want to do is like take your part. Maybe I'll like do some singing on top of it. Yeah. No, <laughs> it looked good. Uh, like as writing it, it's like yeah, I can just switch in real time between different, completely different melodies. Take uh, three. Sing along for them. No, no, this is not gonna be a take three. This it's is gonna the be. Take. Maybe there'll be an edit, but it's good. Coming but the important up, thing is, not everything you plan for Christmas is going to go exactly the way you expected it to. And it's okay. It's fine. It's all part of the holiday story. But what you do expect is This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it. to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Good science to you, Kiki, and just Kiki, no Blair. No Blair. It's just the two of us this Christmas. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I like, all like the, the good old days. Put up. These are nice. In the last week, there have been a couple of birthdays. Happy birthday to you, Justin. Oh, and yeah, thank you. You're welcome. And happy birthday to Blair out there enjoying yeah. her holiday. Oh, we're all about to have a lot of fun, though, because you know what? Twistmas is a time to celebrate science. And we have... A whole bunch of science on the show tonight. Oh my goodness. Yes, we do. Just because Blair is not here doesn't mean that we're missing the science. I mean, we're going to miss Blair, but we have a ton of science to go through. So I have stories about bomb diffusion. Ooh. Yikes. Uh, some new organs. Well, how do we get organs anyway? Where did they come from? Krypton. Yes. Oh. And it, it, it could be a Superman reference, but it's not. Details coming up soon. I also have a bit of a positive, well, not positive, a COVID update and um, some plastic brains. What did you bring, Justin? I've got NASA gets Corona, dragon worm dogs, raining shrews, bow guarding birthdays, 10,000, 2,000 year old monoliths, and Neanderthal pyromaniacs. That sounds like a party. If I ever did hear it. <sighs> and I think, you know, you're you're bringing a bunch of animal news. So I think we've got animal corner-ish topics covered as well. As we jump into the show, I do want to remind all of you that if you're not subscribed to us in all the different places, we are in all the different places. We are on the podcast platforms. Look for This Week in Science or Twist. We are also on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch live streaming every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time. We are Twist Science on Twitch, on Instagram, on Twitter, and our website is twist.org. But now it's time for the Twistmas Science Merriness. Okay, let's go with the Superman first. Want to dig into Krypton? All right. All right. So a planet called Krypton were the people that spawned a superhero called S Superman. He came to Earth. You know, there was tragedy and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, his 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 kryptonite was kryptonite. And, well, kryptonite. Like allergic to it or something. Yeah, pretty badly. Really yeah, but. You know, there is Krypton here on Earth. It is an element, but it really is not in the element Krypton, the mineral Krypton, the kryptonite that causes Superman all sorts of problems. It's 
So really, this isn't a story about a far off planet. This is a story about our very Earth and its ancestry, how it came to be not populated, but seeded with elements like carbon and nitrogen that are in our atmosphere, water. Where did all this stuff come from? In order to discover this, researchers at UC Davis looked at volcanoes. They, they studied magma uh, that was being sh shoved up from the mantle of the Earth in places like Greenland and the Galap... No, not Greenland. I'm sorry. Iceland and the Galapagos Island Islands. Um, this research looking at the magma that's being welling up, being pushed up from the mantle through this this the pressures that are there this is old material from deep in the earth and so it is indicative of earlier phases of the earth's formation and so looking at these volatile elements water carbon nitrogen these researchers uh, have determined that a lot of these volatile elements actually came to be part of Earth before the big giant moon forming impact that created the moon and created the Earth that we now know. There was an early young Earth in which, where did this stuff come from? And we've had ideas of comets and asteroids and all sorts of things. Last week, I talked a bit about uh, the sol solar winds or maybe it was two weeks ago, talked about solar winds causing oxidation reduction reactions and leading to uh, hydrogen and water on grains of dust in the solar system. And so this evidence that's coming out of UC Davis and, uh, and also with uh, researchers from ETH Zurich in Switzerland, it really, really adds to the evidence that there are multiple sources for all of these elements within our Earth. And that, yes, some of it did come billions of years ago in the form of, you know, during the volatile period of our solar system's formation in, in the form of meteorites, chunks of, chunks of space rocks landing on the Earth. But it also came from dust raining down onto the Earth. And that a lot of what we know to be in the earth now uh, is it came from these early, early processes. And the, the strange mm. thing is like, okay, the volatile elements that you think would have disappeared, that they, they clung to the rocks of the earth, even during that massive impact that made the moon. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So. so the stuff that's in the earth is older than the moon. Never yeah, seen. or that the stuff that's in the moon partially is part of, yes, because <laughs> the moon is made partially of the Earth yeah. and the merging of the big uh, planetesimal that ran into the Earth and caused the moon to be formed. Um, yeah, but what they say is the study provides clues for the sources and timing of volatile accretion on Earth and is going to help researchers understand how not only the Earth formed, but other planets in our solar system and planets around other stars as well. So this whole process of, of a Earth creation, rocky planet recreation. Re yeah. So anyway, they got these gas, gas bubbles from lava to sample this old noble gas, Krypton, and they were able to de determine the krypton isotopes and the signatures of the diff different isotopes. In the mantle krypton, it differs in its isotope ratio from the atmospheric krypton ratio. And also the atmospheric ratio of carbon and oxygen and water is different than what was that it, than what is in the, the planet itself. So mm. they've determined mm. that not our atmosphere didn't necessarily come from the same source as the rocks of the earth. Okay. Yeah. Multiple origin story. Yes, mm -hmm. multiple origin story. Exactly. That there are multiple different ways that these volatile elements have come to be a part of everything. 
Very Basically, cool. it's a lot of stuff falling on the earth over a long, 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 long time <laughs> at different times. <laughs> Before the moon and after the moon. We should have like pre-moon and post-moon periods. <sighs> do you want to tell us? Yeah. Oh, you're doing a wardrobe. He's putting on a hat. The Twistmas capping is begun. There we go. Twistmas cap. Now I'm a little bit more in the season. I don't have a kerchief, but Justin is in his cap. Ah, <laughs> Yes. Anyway, interesting, interesting work out of UC Davis on the origins of really interesting compounds that make life possible here on our planet. Yeah. The thing that also makes life possible on our planet is the sun, which we recently, we reached out and touched it almost. What did we do, Justin? Uh, yeah, set the controls for the heart of the sun. Some out of the world corona news. NASA's Parker Solar Probe is partying on the sun back in april the parker probe reached the sun's extended solar atmosphere uh aka the corona and spent five hours there entering and exiting the boundary about three times the data of that interaction is just now being analyzed confirming that the spacecraft is the first ever to enter the outer boundaries of our sun and is the fastest object ever created by humans current speed between 370,000 miles and 600,000 kilometers per hour. Uh, the fastest man-made object ever. Probe made its first direct observations of what lies within the sun's atmosphere, measuring the phenomena previously only estimated from the Earth. Ooh, wow, it got bright. Uh, and so far, things have actually been pretty strange. It's not exactly what was expected. Sun's outer edge uh, begins at something called an Alphian uh, critical surface, point below which the sun and its gravitational magnetic forces control the solar wind. Beyond it, the solar wind goes accelerating away from the sun super fast. The sun's outer edge uh, then uh, was penetrated by this probe. Surprisingly, they found that the, the critical surface, that Albion surface, is wrinkled. So as the, as the probe went through, it sort of entered and re-entered uh, the boundary of the sun's interior without just going directly in. So they got to figure out why that is, why it's not just uniform. Uh, the data so far suggests that the, the largest and most distant wrinkle on the surface was produced by something they're calling a pseudo-streamer a large magnetic structure that is found back in the innermost visible face of the sun. And they don't currently know why that pseudo streamer on the surface of the sun is pushing this critical surface, which is far away from it, away from the sun. But it seems to be having that effect. Researchers also notice far fewer switchbacks below the alpha critical surface than above it. Finding could mean that switchbacks do not form in the corona. Probe also recorded some evidence of a potential power boost just inside the corona, which might point to some unknown physics affecting heating and dissipation that they hadn't anticipated taking place. So having uh, achieved its goal of touching a star, Parker Pro Solar Probe will now descend even deeper into the sun's atmosphere and linger for longer periods of time, which should be just fine. Because the temperature further in to the sun is cooler. It's cooler than the outer. Yeah. It's still very hot, but uh, the, the technology behind the shields on this solar probe is amazing. It's uh, the ability of the shield to block, to, I guess, to dissipate that solar heat is incredible. You can, th you can put a blowtorch on one side of the heat shield. It's about... It's several inches thick. You can blowtorch one side of it and the other side stay, stays cold. The heat doesn't really trans transfer through. Um, I don't know. But this is a this is a probe with a death wish. Death wish. We're going to be getting a whole bunch of... This is like the Twistmas science version of Die Hard. Oh, gosh. <laughs> is there a suicide in Die Hard? I didn't think there was. No. Look, no. Uh, 
yeah, uh, it, it does remind me of the Pink Floyd song, uh, Heart of the Sun. Uh, you know, set the controls for the heart of the sun. That's what this probe has actually done. Uh, it's, I'm actually was surprised to know that this is the first time we've sent anything into the sun. I would have expected we would have been sending things into the sun a long time. Like, uh, just, you know, one way trip, get as much data as you can before the thing melts. But they waited till they got something that wouldn't melt before sending it to the sun, which I guess is smart. <laughs> well, if you're conserving resources, you know that it is going to be a one-way trip, not coming back. How can you create something that will last long enough to be able to send sufficient data back that won't be compromised by the magnetic fields, by the cosmic rays, by everything that comes from our sun? Fastest, uh, fastest craft ever made by man. That's... Uh... Pretty good, pretty good speed there. That thing's built up, and it's not like a, it. If anyway, if you look at it, it doesn't look like a fancy, fast flying spaceship that you would expect. Uh, the fastest ship ever to be. It looks like a little satellite probe looking thing. <laughs> but it's yeah. I can't wait to see like gravity what they, that's pulled into is making. Yeah, I mean they've they've done a pre analysis now of all this data, so I guess it's going to be like what else is going to come from the data as they analyze it further what more as they go deeper into the corona yeah it's more, so exciting more and more we're and not more. just yeah. we're but touching I guess the sun be, it should be safe because it's in the millions of degrees uh, and that's millions of degrees fahrenheit if you switch it over to celsius it's millions of degrees it's still yeah. that hot it's, it's the really same, hot pretty much really just super hot at that point you uh, would not it, survive i would not survive but no but it's, it's gonna get crap. cooler still not human survivable cooler it's but it's gonna hot. it's gonna get much uh like i think it's like a magnitude or more cooler as it heads into the interior so it's gonna uh should be fine should be able to report back no problem <laughs> Should be no problem. Should be no problem. Uh, you know what else is cooling down? India's population growth. Oh, oh gosh. That's no, not, I hope this is not a corona story. This is not a corona story. Okay. This is a story of uh, some questions about methodology in which this target was reached. Uh, but it's a success story in a country that seemed to have an explosive population growth rate massively contributing to the human population here on Earth with a re replacement level of more than 2.1 children per couple, per, per woman. Um, the replacement rate is basically, you know, 2.1 is replacing this the partners in the relationship two children for two parents um, but in this announcement the uh, National Family Health Survey in India has announced that the fertility rate has for the first time fallen below this replacement level and that it is on a track to continue decreasing a bit um, and that even though there is a population boom, that they are still dealing with. And so they will experience growth in the population until about 2050, probably to about 1.8 billion people in the uh, in the country. Um, with the decrease by the end of the century, they will potentially be in negative population growth, which is good news for the earth as a whole. Uh, this was achieved through planned family planning, through sterilization, through contraception, and through education of women. And it was a uh, an effort that the government has been working on for years. However, in the 1970s, this is not the best best story in the long run, a lot of countries have made big mistakes when it comes to sterilization. And in the 1970s, Gandhi allowed the operation of compulsory sterilization camps in which about 19 million people, three quarters of them being men, 
were sterilized, uh, were ordered to be sterilized, uh, not consensually necessarily. Um, sterilization was only compulsory for two years, according to an article from Science Magazine. And uh, after that point, they offered uh, about $15, up, up to $15 for women to be sterilized. So there are still oh, debates as to whether that or not the monetary incentive is related to coercion or whether it's just, hey, we're helping you out. <laughs> um, so that $15, are we talking 15 U.S.? Yes, 15 U.S. dollars, not um, what and Then it, what does that translate into uh, weekly, monthly, yearly? Like, yeah, and it depends in the more in the rural, region. the more mm -hmm. impoverished rural areas, that's going to be a significant sum of money, especially going back into the 1980s. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then is it, is it, uh, then you're talking also, it's like, hey, yeah, there's not enough uh, food to go around here these days, uh, you know, as can happen in India. Uh, yeah. And uh, is that $15 is something somebody will take up in an emergency to feed existing children or themselves? And then, oh, it's just, you know, that's just not a... I completely see the point of needing population control and it, and it seems to go just fine if you just give women the rights to their reproductive system. The right and to choose. Also. Yeah. And right education. Education, and correct. Yes, education, and I, and that that's something that I want to stress here: that the availability of family planning services, the availability of contraception, the availability of female education, you know, you know, for everybody to be educated, really, uh, that when people who can bear children are educated about the responsibilities of bearing children, about the uh, the options that are available to them, it is better for everyone. And when women are educated, as in educated beyond just, you know, this is what you can do for contraception and families, but actually educated, going to high school, going to college, learning about the world so that they can get a job and afford to, uh, to, to, afford to have a family if they want it you know mm -hmm. that that becomes a, a big incentive and actually you know it's one of these things it's a big question for a lot of governments as more women are educated and choose not to have children what does that mean for future population growth many countries now they're looking at india as being one of them the united states is another many uh, northern european scandinavian countries are in this group negative popula population growth is going to impact the economy because you do not have as many young people able to work. And then additionally, you don't have as many young people within the public health system to take care of your aging, your big aging population that occurred before. So there are downsides that have to be managed, but they are not unmanageable. Yeah. Anyway, I am I am of the biological ecological opinion that humanity we we're we're growing too much and you know I don't I don't think we're having a population bomb anymore. Uh, assessments of world population growth have been suggesting that after about 2050, there will be a major decline in the Earth's population of humans, barring any massive tragedies. Um, like a pandemic how could that be a barring like it's got is that doesn't that mean there's got to be a tragedy no just because just with just with educating women availability of contraception and family planning services yes. that's pretty much all you need to create a recipe for and not necessarily you know, not for not for not necessarily having a growing population. No, and it also tends to uh, lend itself towards democratic control of government. It tends to let it lend itself towards less inclination to go to war, to better econ it, economic outcomes. It actually I, does. It's a whole like the empowerment of women is yeah. a starting point for your society. 
is a great trajectory to be on for the rest of the way. Because that seems, I mean, yeah, somehow, that. seems somehow to take care of a lot of the problems. Turns out men, maybe not the best social managers. <laughs> Turns out maybe priorities Aww. are a little off there at times. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about par we were talking about humanity on earth. Let's talk about parasites. Yeah, this is a uh, oh gosh, we got so close. So efforts to eradicate a human parasitic disease are being hampered by dogs. Oh no. So this is we were so close. This but one dogs was, are our best friends. Why would they do this to us? Because they're evil. Oh, <laughs> like, uh, like deep down. They're not evil. They're just gullible. No, they're just, they're just gullible. They're just the dumb uh, <laughs> dogs. Parasite uh, Dracunculus medinensis, mm. or dragon worm, is a round worm nematode that causes a disease called guinea worm disease. Disease, the disease is basically a result of a parasite's reproductive cycle taking place in an animal host. When it takes place in humans, those humans find it to be most unpleasant. So the initial sort of target, uh, of, I guess, of the worm in this cycle here is a freshwater crustacean known as a water flea, uh, where the worm's larvae seems to accumulate. I don't know if they're just getting stuck to it or if this... If the water fleas are gobbling them up, but somehow these water fleas accumulate a bunch of the worm's larvae, then they uh, get caught up in some drinking water. So guinea worm disease is usually caught by drinking water containing these water fleas that are then themselves carrying the larvae. If you happen to drink a bunch of worm larvae, nothing noticeable happens at first. Though going unnoticed are the hatched larva worms mating and growing inside of your body. No! Yeah. Merry but, Twistmas! But things are still fine until about a year uh, later. A year of growing, mating, and reproducing and uh, producing new larvae inside of you long, long after you've forgotten about that uh, having sipped that water unfiltered from a stagnant pond in Central Africa, thinking you are well clear of any ill that could have come from that carelessness, painful blisters begin to form, typically on the arms and legs. They create a burning sensation. And, That's where the and worms are. It's not It's get, not blisters, is it? No, it's blisters. It's just oh, okay. blisters. <laughs> and, they, and they have like this burning sensation to them that you feel immediately compelled to She's like, oh, put those burning sores in some cool, cold water. And, hmm. and then and so, as soon as you're touching that water, adult worms begin to emerge from the blisters. Because uh, they're, they're wanting to then shed larvae back into the water right. to continue their life cycle. That makes sense. And these, uh, these adult worms, when they emerge, they're very small, teeny tiny little things uh they're around they're small around but they can be anywhere from three feet to a meter long in length three feet to a meter ah, yep. somewhere, somewhere in there right in there you can pull them out but only just a few centimeters each day ah. so removing them removing them can take weeks and you have to be careful not to kill them because if you kill them, if you break them off, if they die, they die in you. Oh, and they decompose no. and the remaining worm beneath the skin can cause all sorts of problems as it decays away within your flesh. Now, I think terrifyingly. I think it's, it's almost as hard. It's probably as painful to have it as it is listening to you describe it right now. <laughs> it is not a... <laughs> This is not a. I, hey, this is only on the Christmas Eve show because it happened to be a published thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. I grew up Please. with that where there is no doctor book, and I'm still having a hard time with this. Okay, keep going. I can do this. Okay, so bad news is that the, around 19 in the 1980s, uh, there were um, millions of cases of guinea worm. A year. Millions of cases of this. 
2020, there were just 27. Largely through education and, and the introduction to uh, personal water filtration systems, even to the point where you can get a straw. If you're in the Central Africa, it's pretty accessible to get a straw with a filter that's sufficient to drink from one of these stagnant ponds if you need to. That prevents the water fleas from being uptaken, so the larva stays out, so this guinea worm disease. Almost completely eradicated from humans. It would be the, only the second disease since smallpox that's been completely eliminated. But the dogs. Now you have to tell us where the dogs come in. So yeah, just now, uh, it, it seems like it was, it was going away. Turns out it is thriving in dog populations. In 2020, they did that. They were they did a bunch of testing. Uh, they even had satellite tracking on these dogs to try to figure out where they were going because 93% of guinea worms detected worldwide now are in dogs, and specifically dogs in Chad, Africa. So this is this is very now specifically in dogs. And they they uh, after uh, some research, they figured out this is research by the University of Exeter. They found that dogs are eating fish that were caught by fishermen and discarded. So these are small fish that maybe didn't make it to the meal. This is uh, cut up guts from the fish that they're being fed to the dogs that are containing these parasites. So uncooked fish being fed to dogs is maintaining this population. So cook the fish. Before you feed it to the dog. Before you <laughs> cook the food before you yeah. eat it, or maybe freeze it to the point where the parasite dies. Yeah, yeah. there, are, there. Are or meds. stop, uh, stop having dogs. I don't know. I don't know what the right. I don't know about that solution. We're well, gonna keep do having dogs. Yeah, maybe don't feed them the raw fish if you're in Central Africa. Maybe it's yeah. The... But it's a good story uh, because we're all, we almost got rid of it and, and it's got a little reservoir, but we've identified it. So that's the good news. Yeah. Just good news. Just good news. We identified everybody. the reservoir for a parasite, so now we can deal with it. Yeah. However, however, that the public health. Uh, and more just good news. Uh, good you may more? never have to hear a description of that worm again. <laughs> you, need worm disease. you may never have to endure that again i would i would like to never have to go through that again that would be great i would really appreciate that please um so let's talk about uh let's move on to some other interesting topics like did, i don't know worms have organs dogs have organs we all animals have organs organs are composed of multiple different cell types all working together for some overarching function. So like mm -hmm. your stomach digests your food, your kidneys filter your blood, your spleen. I, does anyone really know what the spleen does? No, I'm kidding. Um, the spleen is, is very important. Uh, but organs, where do they come from? Where do they come from? Researchers publishing in Cell this last week have uh, have been looking at a little beetle, a rove beetle, and its defense gland to answer this question. And in looking at this defense gland, they have determined that there have been, through the evolution of the beetle, it modified cuticle cells in its outer in its its exoskeleton and other cells within a different pathway and kind of put them together merged them and adapted the cells so that they all started working together and created a gland that the beetle could then use for defense and so this is a an unexpected cellular what they're saying coevolution and that that it is this co-evolution of purpose between multiple different cell types coming together that allows for organ level properties to be selected. 
They say that in their abstract, we show that evolution of each cell type was shaped by co-evolution between the two cell types, yielding a potent secretion that confers adaptive value. Our findings illustrate how cooperation between cell types arises, generating new organ level behaviors. So your organs, they didn't just come out of nowhere and it's just like, you have a spleen. No, that's not how it works. There were step-by-step processes that different cells began to work together for a common purpose. Cool. It's pretty, I, I find it very interesting. The evolution. Yeah. The evolution of these, these organs, um, these cell types to, and interesting that just studying a beetle can lead researchers to these larger, uh, larger realizations. Yeah. Human body uh, itself is just an incredible uh, thing but to, to know that like, yeah, we could have had a couple different organs. We could have had like a venom sack. We could have had, you know, we could have worked on some other tissue as well. Apparently like it was all out there available. We could have had a venom sac if we, you know, decided to take cuticle cells from yeah. our our skin and, you know, our uh, things that became fingernails. Maybe they could have been venomous fingernails. And you and know? the thing is, now thanks to the uh, wondrous breakthroughs in science, we, we still can have those things. We Maybe still can. Maybe in the future. You know. Yeah. So anyway, they uh, what they were able to do is... Uh, figure all this out, not just by looking at the gland and going, look at that, all the types, they must have merged together. They looked specifically at the molecular architecture and were able to use single cell transcriptomics to determine the pathways for these defensive compounds in the what they call the turgle cell. It's the turgle gland, the turgle gland cell types. Um, and they were able to infer transcript, transcriptomic and pathway relationships to be able to, uh, between the cell types, to be able to trace how it was assembled over time. So wow. the transcriptome being the transcripts, the, the messenger RNA, the mRNA, the pieces, little bits and pieces that are copied from the DNA to go on to make proteins and mm -hmm. create the rest of the organs. Interesting. So in a way, I guess you could also then sort of back engineer stepwise to some extent uh, how the how to how to set about forming biological life. Uh, <laughs> and that's really, a, I mean, that's an interesting additional uh, thing to think about is knowing this. Where could you take it? Yeah. So if you if you have the the well, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of thinking for like a. If you wanted to actually do like create the humans with venom sacks, that's not a thing uh, anybody really, I don't think, it wants to have. But when you're when you're sort of doing uh, artificial engineering of evolution, you are trying to push things in a direction. You might want a tissue that does a function uh, in a in a small microorganism in a biotech setting, for instance. One of those uh, Chinese hamster, ovary hamster, uh, hamster ovaries, one of those things, or uh, yeast or bacillus, some kind of a thing like this that you're trying to add just a function to. Knowing how cell tissues on a larger scale get directed into becoming a thing might be useful. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we're beyond that. <laughs> Evolution in a dish. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Hello, sci-fi. All right. You want to tell me another story? Do you have one? Uh, here? Yeah, there was a major mammal discovery manifesting in the description of 14 new species of shrews. <laughs> Largest number of new mammals described. Shrews. In the scientific, in the scientific paper since 1931. So it's, uh, it's wow. been a while since one paper held as many as 14 new species of mammal. Kind of a, kind of a long record. There are a long time since this has happened. This is a decade-long journey of taking inventory in, of Indonesian shrews living in the island of Suwesi. 
group of scientists led by LSU mammalogist, mammalogist? Mm-hmm. Jake Esselstein has identified the 14 new species. Uh, they detailed this in a recently published paper in Bulletin of the American Museum of Natural History. The quote from uh, Esselstein is, uh, <laughs> I really like this. It's an exciting discovery, but it was frustrating at times. Usually, we discover one species at a time, and there is a big thrill that comes with that. But in this case, it was overwhelming because for the first several years, we couldn't figure out how many species there were. So a clearer picture began to emerge once the research team examined not just what they could find uh, in their in their searches, but also the extensive collection of genetic and morphological data from from the other species that were collected back in 1916. They ended up with 1,400 specimens in all, and recognized 21 species of shrew on the island of Sulawesi, including that's a 14. lot for one island. It is. It is. That's the other remarkable part of this story. So it's a lot of, for one big island. It's a pretty yeah. decent size for an island. It's a big island, but but still, uh, I mean, that indicates that there are room. all sorts of different ecosystems that would have pushed mm. the adaptations that would have led to the eventual speciation that occurred. Yeah. Right. Maybe there were population bottlenecks. Maybe they're like this is fascinating. Yeah, so this is, uh, he, he's going to keep studying those uh, those shrews there. But it's also, yeah, like you like you were saying, it's a great way of looking at biological evolution. And it's going to be a, a wonderful thing to sort of study uh, for a long time to come. Especially since, you know, you got 21 species currently there. That's fantastic. That's a, that's a massive increase just for, I mean, just go mammals. There's more of us now that we named them. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. They were already there. Uh, yeah. But, you know, the, the, if it's just, if the, all 21 species are just called the shrews of Indonesia, and it's just the shrews, you know, but knowing that they have individual uh, speciation is pretty interesting. So. And I, yeah, and I think the definitely understanding what are the, what are the environmental forces at play? that allow them to be species and how can we pay attention to that for conservation and you know, maintaining ecosystems and knowing what's necessary. Yeah. And if you didn't individuals know, alive. Yeah. And if you didn't know that there was 21 individual species as a shrew breeder, you know, having a shrew farm might, uh, you know, it might explain why it hasn't always been successful. Uh, breeding shrews if they're all different species that you've been bringing in. Exactly. Oops, I got the wrong one. I didn't know they didn't like each other no idea. because they don't. They're not recognizing each other. That's not necessarily how it works. <sighs> we hope you're here recognizing this week in science. This is our Twistmas e episode. So far on the show, it's been full of um, kind of disturbing presents. But I like having a whole bunch of shrews under the tree. Oh. Yeah. Am I shrewd for thinking that? Thank you for being a part of Twist. We're so glad that you are enjoying science with us. All right. Let's come back. Wait, where did Justin go? <laughs> All right. I'm going to come back with a COVID update. So we've got some COVID news for you. COVID news for you. Yes. Omicron continues to spread rapidly, very rapidly around the globe, spurring heightened alerts by public health agencies and local governments. At least one American university, Cornell, has shuttered in-person finals and graduation has been canceled as a result of a dramatic increase in cases on campus of COVID-19 and evidence of Omicron in their testing. They have shut everything down in the hopes that it's going to prevent a larger outbreak in the community. A large and scientists are warning that although Omicron might not result in serious disease as often, 
especially with high rates of vaccination and previous infection in many places. The transmissibility is enough that the sheer number of cases will very likely overload hospitals if people do not play their part and take prevention seriously. So here is a list of Twistmas safety recommendations. Get your booster if you're vaccinated. That's really going to help. You should do it this week so you're ready for it next week. That would be great. Take ventilation and masks seriously. Open those windows if you can. HEPA filtration mm-hmm. works if you've got HEPA filters. And definitely dig out those N95s, K and 95 masks. Definitely for the win. Be transparent. Talk openly with your friends and family about risk factors. Where have you been? Who have you been talking to? Where have they been? Who have they been talking to? Who needs to be protected? You need to have these conversations if you have not yet had them with your family and you're planning to spend time together over these holiday weeks. Rapid testing is your friend. Rapid tests can really help to determine infection or uh, lack of contagiousness. So is PCR. PCR might be harder to come by, but wrap, but it's there and we should use these tools to our advantage if we can. Think about ways to reduce your potential for infection. What can you do? What can you as a person do to be good for your community? If you have concerns, talk to a doctor, check the CDC website, and do your best to keep your community protected. We are all in this together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so I I'm haven't making gotten, a list and checking it twice for Christmas gotten, is going to be nice if we all are doing our best. I, have a, I haven't gotten the coronavirus yet. Yeah, The Rona? Yet. I haven't gotten the vid. The majority, people, pretty much everybody will probably get it eventually. I mean, that's... What's going to happen? And I, I'm starting to think it. of it in terms of the yet because. Yeah, that's how we should all kind of get get to at some point. Yeah. And I'm like, is this. A, uh, it's in this. This one is going bad. Like this is uh, the I think the British, the UK is saying that they're going to be. This is going to be the predominant species or variant uh, causing infection in, in the UK by the end of this month. Yeah. It's going to take over. Uh, it's had a 40% daily increase, I think. Uh, something horrible like that. Like, it's really insanely taking off. Much more transmissible. Like you said, uh, that it, even if it's less deadly on to an individual basis, it's going to hit more people. It's just more shots at causing human suffrage. Yep. And it is a respiratory virus, so masks can help to slow the spread of those respiratory aerosol particles um, and the droplets that we've heard so much about. And additionally, what was it? What else was I? Oh, uh, the transmissibility. Part of what makes it more infectious is from what they have seen is that it replicates in it gets into cells and replicates inside cells much faster even than Delta. So the, the rate of viral proliferation within your cells is very high, but it's in the bronchioles. It doesn't do a good job of replicating in the lungs, and they don't know why that is yet. But they're hoping that maybe what this means is it's going to be more transmissible, but if it's not getting into the lungs as easily, perhaps mm-hmm. it won't be as severe. And we also know that so far... It's been a lot of younger individuals who have been infected and who are showing up as uh, as having been exposed. So we don't necessarily know if this is like a population age group bias or if it is actually a, a, a less severe virus. Could also be vaccination and previous infection are allowing people to fight it off a little bit, even though it might be evading some of those defenses. There are so many questions still, but the best we can do is to remember that we can do our best. Our choices matter, and our choices will affect the future. And speaking of the past and the future, I have a retracted study. Oh. Yeah. um, So back 
back in March or something like that, there was a a study that came out finding no effect of lockdowns on COVID-19 deaths. And some researchers went back and looked at the data and they found that the methods were faulty. They tried putting data into like fake data into the model that the original study used and they found they could not even with data that would prove would show that there was an effect or was an effect they the model didn't work the model Mm. was faulty um so really uh the faulty moth methods were unable to actually find the effects that they reported even if they did actually exist so Wow, that's the authors an, have that's retracted an... the paper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, test your models, uh, boys and girls, uh, before uh, publishing your science yeah. papers. Yeah, God, yeah the other... make sure your model is telling you something, not just noise. One of the good things about this also is that the researchers were very transparent. They uploaded all of their data to and their model to uh, an, a, a research database so that other researchers could model their data and do what they did. And that that is what allowed the other researchers to come in and say, oh, you actually didn't do this right. We put in more data, more numbers, and it's not working the right way. Mm-hmm. Uh, the researchers were very unhappy about having to retract their paper. Yeah. But they, they did. And uh, and it's good for everyone. Although the harm has already been done because this is the kind of thing. It's like the first headline that's out there. Yeah. If you retract a news story, people Never. remember the original. They don't remember the retraction. So this is in the public in the public sphere. The original. Lockdowns yeah. don't here's, work here's is the what's... is the take home message. But now this retraction is we have to work very hard yeah. to let people know that this study didn't actually show that. Here's what's really tricky about this. You do the study, it says lockdowns have no effect. If you're a rational person, which maybe nobody, none of these scientists were uh, on this this common sensey rationality thing, you go, hey, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, there's no way that having a lockdown during a pandemic has no effect versus not having a lockdown. It just can't be right. Let's go check all of our models and see what's going on here. On the other hand, if the scientist doesn't like the result of their experiment and decides to can it and try again, that's confirmation bias. Yep. So you're kind of like, you kind of have to go, oh gosh. Oh, we're going to have to publish this. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. But I kind of have to because this is the result that we got. And somebody knock it down or tell me I'm right or wrong. Yeah. That's fine. Here's how we did it. Ugh, not my problem now. Other people can look at this. Because, yeah. because there is like the... When it comes to like giving a health, like something that can be taken as a health advice, I kind of agree. Maybe they should have like waited longer. Maybe this one didn't need to publish so soon. But again, they thought the other they, side had of found, is, they they thought they had something. So yeah, they, but the they other needed side to is publish what they had. Right? Yeah, so, it was oof, yeah, definitely. it was a bit of that. <sighs> I just watched uh, an episode of The Big Bang Theory. I'm watching The Big Bang Theory with my ten year old son, and uh, it was an episode in which. Sheldon Cooper had discovered a a new heavy element, super heavy element, and uh, some uh, and his roommate Leonard had done some experiments on it and discovered that the Chinese researchers who had found the element for with Sheldon had falsified their data and that there was actually no heavy element. And at first, Sheldon was upset that he had incorrectly he had the logic incorrect on why the element was there in the first place. And so he was like, I shouldn't have found it. And he was mad that he was getting attention. But then when Leonard had the confirmation that there was no element, he comes back and says, you need to publish. You have to publish this. And Leonard says, okay. And Sheldon says, God, why are you ruining my day? (laughs) Science. You have to do it. You're not going to make someone's day, but it has to be done. It's a great episode. 
This is This Week in Science. We hope we are filling your day with merriment and cheer and a whole bunch of science this year. Science today, science this year. That's what we're all about. I do have a few calendars yet left. So if you are interested in getting your 2022 Blair's Animal Corner twist calendar, head over to twist.org, click on the frog and order away. The order uh, is through PayPal. I will be able to mail them out until Wednesday of next week. So if you want them before the new year, hopefully the mail will work that way to get them to you in time for 2022. This is This Week in Science. We thank you for your support. We really can't do any of this without you. Thank you for everything. All right, Justin, we're going to come back right now. And I think it's I think it's your turn because there's no animal corner. What do you have? Oh, yeah. Let me see the order of the things. Oh, yeah. Here we go. It started uh, snowing here, by the way. Oh, wow. The snow is falling in the dark. Nice. What do you have? Researchers from Washington State University have evidence the giant stone monoliths of southern Ethiopia were a thousand years older than previously thought. Mm. The Sakaro Soto is known to have the largest number and highest concentration of these megalithic monuments in Africa, with an estimate of more than 10,000 of these things and 60 or more uh, different clusters. And to be clear, these are, aren't just phallic stones raising up out of the, out of the landscape. These are 10,000 carved penises jutting up some six Wait, meters what? tall, others Wait, what? as much as 20 feet high. What? Huh? These are, they're, they're penises. They're not just phallic like an uh like a like a tall obelisk of of carved stone might generally be phallic no these ones have a little bit more detail <laughs> to them and we and and we're just figuring this out so no we we've, we've, we've so this is the thing it's <laughs> they're a thousand years old we would we didn't figure this out before now <laughs> they were they were sure. thought to be uh a thousand years old uh, okay. It turns out they're more like 2,000 years old. So these okay. were first studied by some French researchers back in the 90s. They said, ah, uh, probably year 1100 AD. And now they've gone back. They're being they're under consideration for being a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But they still have They've been there for in that holding pattern for a while. Uh, still haven't gotten approved. And I'm thinking it's because at some point, the World Heritage Site is going to be 10,000 stone penises, many of which are three oh. meters high. <laughs> that, that it's just, it's a World Heritage Site. This is 2,000 year old, and it's, and it's an amazing, amazing site. Yeah, but those are penises. They're large stone obelisks. <laughs> No, 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 they're not just obelisks. Those are some pictures. Go, go, go Google it up and pull up some other photos. Some of them are much more obvious about what they're what they are than things. I'm gonna simply... I'm gonna refrain from Googling. But no, this is an archaeological from, site. Right. And researchers are going and looking at the old stone penises and going, those are old. But they seem to have some significance too. It seems like yeah. generation after generation, some of these were burial sites. Some of them seem to be showing the transfer of power between generations. Huh. I'm assuming it's a male dominated society. That's there yeah, does yeah, fair not assumption. seem to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the researcher who went down there is Ethiopian uh, of descent. Uh, researchers uh, out of, I think it's North Dakota, University of North Dakota. At least, yeah, I lost the, the uh, story. Here. But uh, we actually initially went down there to, was going to study some caves or something. This is uh, Ashanafi uh, Zina, who's the lead author of the study, doctoral researcher now at the State Historical Society of North Dakota. He's gone down to study caves. 
and came, uh, you know, went to go look at these things and went, oh my goodness, this is, this is an incredible archaeological site and very little, very little study really has been, had been done on this, even though it's been there for thousands of years. So looking at the stones, many of which had fallen to the ground and some have broken to pieces, I decided to focus my dissertation work there instead of investigating cave sites in southern Ethiopia. One of the things they discovered, uh, on the, uh, aside from some sort of the getting the carbon dating right on, on these stone structures, was the obsidian that had been identified at those sites was sourced some 190 miles to 300 kilometers away in northern Kenya. Hmm. So that also illustrates that thousands of years ago, pretty extensive trade routes were already operating across Africa to allow the, the trade. Which, doesn't, which is not surprising when you think about it. People uh, have, it been, is, people it have is, been living in Africa for, for since the beginning. And it's not surprising that people would be having trade routes and moving from place to place. Yeah. So in Western Africa, uh, it's very well known what the, the sort of trade routes that existed because you had people who were living in sort of different ecological uh, regions, some mm -hmm. plains, some more jungle, connected by rivers. And right. there's a some really nice record of that trade going way, 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 way back. There wasn't the, you get to the Western side and that, that the records of trade sort of fall off. So there has been this idea that African society sort of uh, was burgeoned in, uh, in, in West Africa. And then as uh, trade and connections uh, to, well, I guess from the camel, I guess the, once the camel could cross deserts and they could trade with the you know, regions further and further away, there became an additional livestock available and, you know, there's another big expansion there. Uh, but I think a lot, a lot less is known what, what went on during those times of sort of Eastern African trade routes. Um, but yeah, so a lot of, a lot of fun stuff, but I, I have a feeling, I really do the, the idea that uh, this is a world heritage site and it's been delayed and there hasn't been that much research done on, even though you have 10,000, 10,000 of, 10, of them. That is I mean, look at how much uh, Stonehenge gets uh, <laughs> gets uh, looked at. And I mean, there's no ten thousand stones standing up. And the only reason I can think is that the, uh, the vast majority of these uh, obelisks are carved to look like penises, and that apparently has some effect on their ability to be researched. <laughs> possibly I, yeah or it could be that people have uh had not had enough of a, a real academic interest in the cultural heritage of many civilizations tribal bradley, bradley white in, in africa yeah. chat room saying bone hedge no oh. no these are not made out of bone they're made, made out, out of, of a, a stone skin. but you can't yeah. use hedge because that's a different anyway so many I, 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 the, I'm fascinated with the significance of it like this it's you know it's definitely power related but like you said generational shifting of power there's uh celebratory aspects of it there like, it's fascinating fascinating and the way that you know a Beavis and butthead butthead trained mind initially heads is not the direction that other people will think of it. You have more stories? Yeah. What are you talking about? Uh, I, yeah, I got a bunch more. As we approach I grew up on Beavis and Butthead. I, I, very infantile uh, at times. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> As we approach uh, December 25th, they're prepared to celebrate the birthday of the beloved uh, uh, baby Humphrey Bogart. As was well it Copernicus he... or something? Galileo? Galileo's birthday is coming up. There's also like a dozen or more famous, once popular deities who are yeah. specifically born to virgin mothers who are also born on this day. Like yes. there's like a long list. Many. It's a very popular day to be born to a virgin 
uh, mother. So somebody needs to do the backtrack, right? The nine months, the, the 40 weeks back yeah, yeah, yeah. from the date and figure out when is God uh, getting Randy? When are the gods you know I mean? like, oh, I need to. In the springtime because it was spring. I mean, come on. Okay. What you got? Go. What you got for me here? All right. So let's have a pregnant pause for a moment. And think about the mothers and babies in this uh, this time. Nearly one in four pregnant women in a new study say they've been unable to afford necessary health care. Three out of five have concerns about paying basic medical bills. Pregnancy and the year after delivery are a critical period for health care access for expecting mothers and babies. Yet more than half of women in a five-year study describe general financial stress over all their expenses, including monthly bills, housing costs, minimum payments on credit cards, maintaining good standard of living, uh, just getting through the pregnancy in this sort of post-pregnancy period. This is quoting uh, Michelle Moniz, who's an MD and obstetrician gynecologist, University of Health, Von Voigtlander Women's Hospital, senior author of the study. Our study suggests that financial hardship is exceedingly common among the birthing population in the United States, with many parents experiencing unmet health care need due to cost, health care unaffordability, and general financial stress. Uh, these findings appear in JAMA Network Open, uh, include a national sample of 3,500 uh, peripartum women between 2013 and 2015, Prenatal and postpartum visits provide essential preventative services for both women and infants, including vaccinations, screening for gestational diabetes and anemia, an opportunity to do early diagnosis and management of pregnancy complications, Moni says. But for some, the cost of health care is a barrier to actually utilizing these services that are recommended. Women with private insurance and those living on lower incomes were more likely to experience unaffordable health care than women with public insurance and those with higher incomes, the study found. 24% of women with unmet health care need uh, re uh, reported during uh, being unable to afford the medical care. Prescription medications, eyeglasses, mental health care, or said that they or a family member had delayed or deferred needed care due to costs. People who delay or forego medical care due to financial barriers are more likely to report worse health outcomes, says Moniz. Financial hardship has also been shown to be associated with poor mental health. Household income often fails dramatically around the time of childbirth. This is something... Uh, that uh, there was a study, I don't know if we talked about it, that uh, Germany had done that showed like they that having a baby also had an 18% decline in uh, income for mothers beyond that. Uh, it's, it was like a career interrupter uh, and they created programs yeah. that, that uh, allowed women to maintain um, their jobs. Basically it's a, you know, maternity leave uh, got, uh, reliable and more extensive maternity leave got added and it removed that 18% uh, decline. Findings suggest urgent need to improve healthcare and affordability, reducing or eliminating out-of-pocket costs, co-payments, co-insurance, deductible payments for recommended healthcare. One of the solutions she thinks uh, could be useful, but it underscores the importance of stable insurance coverage for pregnant and postpartum women. A lot of women have to change coverage. Uh, yeah, you change too. a job, you have to change coverage. You mm -hmm. leave a job, you need to get COBRA and then find your own coverage. Um, there are, you know, the <sighs> volatility of it is, yeah. is difficult to maintain. And when you change insurance, you have to sometimes change providers because not all providers take all insurances and they're different systems and... So you can't even have consistency in the people who treat you. Yeah. Uh, the, it says, does point out that the uh, Affordable Care Act, that's that uh, Obamacare uh, dealio, has made uh, some 
definite uh, advances, has, has made things better. One of the things that did eliminate a lot of health plans that weren't actually health plans, just called them health plans, even though they didn't cover anything. Usually you couldn't get anything covered, any kind of coverage for being pregnant. Right. And under a lot of these plans, which meant there were huge regions of the United States where you couldn't even get a health care plan to cover pregnancy. It all had to come out of pocket private, which is a, yep. a ridiculous thing. Which is a uh, huge so, financial burden. Yeah. Yeah. In short, there's little support from the healthcare system and the financial system in America for having children. And while there's growing political support for limiting women's access to birth control, following this trajectory will lead the nation down a path of worse and worse outcomes for newborn health. Every pregnancy is a me thing. Every pregnancy should, be, should, uh, pregnancy should be accompanied by access to midwives. It's some of the best training you can possibly get on what to expect uh, and how to deal with things. If you're going to have a baby, go consult with some midwives. Even this is just an advice. This not, is just this an is, advice. This is just an advice. Yeah. This is absolutely just an advice. But this should be mandatory uh, that you everyone should have access to midwives. Uh, medical screenings and financial support. Should have access. From, yeah. Should have. Yeah. Should have access. Should consult with them. You're, you, you should have should medical screenings and yes. You should go take a class like from it. midwives if you plan on having a baby. They will teach you things that you aren't going to hear from a nurse from practitioner, a or from your doctor, mm -hmm. from anybody else. Uh, uh, having done this uh, numerous times, the best information about giving birth and being pregnant has come from midwives. Yeah. Uh, there should be also mandatory, mandatory maternity leave for no less than four weeks and six months after a child is born, in my opinion. There is a minimum standard uh, close to this. I think it's uh, up to four months now. The European Union has created some minimum standards for for uh, m mandatory maternity leave uh, that allows women to take time off to have a baby, bond with a baby, uh, and recoup to return to the workplace. The United States has none. Really has yeah. no minimum. Yep. There's, so, yeah. So and we're not looking standard. at getting one either. Yay. We, uh, but, but Newton's yeah, but birthday. Are, was December 25th, according to Eric Knapp. And Schnago says that Newton's birthday is December 25th only on the Julian calendar because Eng England was switching at the time. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Tax cuts for billionaires so they can become rocketeers is apparently the thing preventing us from meeting the basic needs of How about mothers fire? and babies that fire. other nations. What are you talking about? Fire. You had a story about fire. Fire. Oh, you're done with this story. Okay. Yeah, I'm done let with me, it. <laughs> let me move on then. Okay. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So Neanderthals <laughs> used fire. Uh, we know that. They used it to warm the cave, cook with. And now we've uh, discovered that they also used it to clear landscapes. Uh, the study by archaeologists from Leiden University in collaboration with researchers elsewhere found Neanderthals use fire to keep their landscapes open and did so for thousands of years. This is the Newmark Nord area. It's a quarry in Germany. They found abundant traces of Neanderthal activity. Hundreds and hundreds of slaughtered animals surrounded by the stone tools that the Neanderthals used and a huge amount of charcoal remains. Traces were found in what uh, 125,000 years ago was a forest area where they had prey like horses, deer, cattle, elephants, lions, hyenas. This is a quarry in Germany. I didn't know they had lions and hyenas there. Mixed deciduous forest stretched from the Netherlands to Poland in several places in the area were lakes and on the edges of some of these lakes Traces of Neanderthals have been found. Will Robux, an archaeology professor at Leiden University, explains that at the point when these Neanderthals turn up and start showing up in the record, the closed uh, forest made way to open spaces, in part due to fires. So the question then was, okay, were there fires 
And then the Neanderthals were like, hey, this is uh, handy. This is big open space. So let's move there. Or did the Neanderthals move there and start fires and create open spaces? And they found sufficient evidence to conclude that the Neanderthals kept the area open for about 2,000 years. Because they were shown that there's lake areas where the same animals roam, but there are no traces of Neanderthal, and there's no traces of fires. Huh. They, 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 the fire seems to follow the Neanderthals everywhere they go on this landscape. So, so they were using fire to clear the landscape, to manage the landscape, to mm -hmm. help them hunt. Mm -hmm. All these uh, probably yeah. help hunt to be able to uh, look longer distances to see yeah. if there was like dangerous uh, animals around. And uh, so yeah. it was a tool. They were they were they were doing environmental management. Yeah. yeah. Or they were just really bad at putting out fires. They were bad <laughs> at campfires. Like you don't like we don't actually. You know, I mean, that's one. Right? Yeah. One idea. Is One like, interpretation oh, is that they were doing all this. Yeah. <laughs> Could have just been they were bad at putting out campfires. Like they didn't know how to do it. it hadn't been figured out. I hopefully they were thinking about what they were doing. I like I like to think of I like the the idea of our Neanderthal relatives as it's thoughtful. Yeah. 2,000 years of campfires, I think you figure out how to put a campfire out if you need to. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. That's neat, though. What an interesting what an interesting connection. The fire follows the Neanderthals. Yeah. Maybe. This is This Week in Science. We give you the gift of twists every week. Right now, it's the gift of Twistmas, and we hope that you all have a wonderful Twistmas with science. And please share this with a friend. I got some stories. How about some stories about the brain? Let me surprise you with something, huh? Because I never talk about the brain. brain. brain the brain, yes. Brain plasticity is uh, crucial for our ability to learn, for the brain's ability to adapt, for the brain's ability to protect itself, uh, this ability of the brain to form new connections, to be plastic. We think of it as kind of this moving thing where it's got these little projections, the dendrites, the axons that go out and connect with other neurons and that can make new connections and that maybe it's constantly always moving around. But there is actually a part of the of the functioning of the brain in which it likes to not necessarily be plastic. When something's working really well, when connections are where they want to be, uh, the brain likes to stabilize those things. And so in stabilizing those connections, they have an extracellular matrix, which is like scaffolding within the brain. And the scaffolding of the brain is made up of these metalloproteins, these, uh, which, which is interesting, Justin, because on previous shows, you've talked about these organic metalloprotein complexes that uh, chemists are starting to use to do a lot of scaffolding and hold onto things in the environment. Um, and so it's really fascinating, interesting that in the brain, we also have these metalloproteins that scaffold the structure, the architecture of the brain. So we have the stability that is provided by that extracellular matrix. But then when plasticity needs to happen, something needs to degrade those structural proteins so that growth and change can happen. And so there's a family of proteinases, these enzymes called matrix metalloproteinases because they digest the metalloproteins and or they enzymatically cleave them so that they break up and allow plasticity to occur. And so th these researchers publishing in the Journal of Neuroscience this week looked at how a couple of these metalloproteinases are involved in mediating uh, plasticity in the adult primary visual cortex. And so that in mice, 
so much in mice. This is like they give a gift to mice. No, um, in these mice, it's healthy adult mice. They were inhibiting the metalloproteinases to see what happened um, when they did these ocular dominance tests. So like an eye, one eye was covered up and not allowed to have any vision for a period of time. And they inhibited the metalloproteinase to see what would happen. They did the same with a different metalloproteinase after a cortical stroke that they that they initiated in the mouse brain to see what happened. And so they determined that when the brain was injured and needed to recover, the extracellular matrix provides this, scap this scaffolding for the synaptic circuits so that it so it's uh, what they're thinking is that this en an enzymatic proteolysis is what they call it. The process of the enzymes breaking up the proteins regulates homeostasis between stability and reorganization or plasticity. Um, and so they actually found that there were there was differential responses when the brain was in a healthy state and was kind of damaged when these metalloproteinases allow were allowing plasticity to occur or when the brain was injured and the 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 plasticity occurred and so in the brain these enzymes work kind of balancing the need for stability or change hmm. yeah so in the future we may end up in a situation where where we are you know able to use these metalloproteinases to help increase plasticity in a brain that has suffered a stroke or when there's been damage and a brain is fighting and trying to maintain its rigidness, its structural structural integrity, but needs to be plastic so that function, behavioral function can be restored. Potentially, we can use these metalloproteinases as targets in the future to be able to therapeutically help people with brain injuries. Yeah, inducing uh, plasticity sounds like a yeah. beneficial, just a midlife uh, crisis. You're like, ah, I don't like the way my brain is wired. <laughs> I need more plasticity in my life. I just need to, I want to rearrange my brain in a yeah. less painful way than has been done traditionally. Because that could actually even be a, yeah. Just add some enzymes. So just, just no big deal. Just add some enzymes. Just add the enzymes. Um, and my last story for the night, it's all about life because that is this planet's great gift to all of us. This Twistmas, we're going to talk about how life could have come to be. And we've talked so many times about so many different hypotheses about the origins of life on the planet. What are some of these stories that that we've talked about. Remember a couple testing. of them. Uh, <laughs> one is the one is the panspermia life came via comet water. Right. Uh, could have. Another another is the thermal vents, uh, the clay uh, down in the soil becoming the first structure that was like cell walls for chemical reactions to take place. Um, porous rocks, maybe. Or maybe that's the same as the clay one. Maybe it's only two. Pond water? It didn't necessarily. Huh? Yeah, it didn't have to be know. hydrothermal vents. It could have been volcanic ponds. No. You know, it could have been just where hot water is happening. Yeah, but there are all these ideas. And, and there have been experiments through the years showing the chemical processes that, oh, if you start with these ingredients, these little building blocks, you get these other pieces mm -hmm. that could have gone on to become the building blocks of life, right? You have these things that could happen, this could happen. Okay, a new paper out in Frontiers of Microbiology has look at, taken a look at all of the evidence to date related to the thermodynamics of the chemistry of hydrothermal vents. And the big take-home message uh, after analyzing over 400 chemical reactions that could have taken place in a very ancient ancestor of ours. Uh, they've they have said hydrothermal vents have all of the pieces in place to allow for the spontaneous construction of life. Wow. Wow. That start based on the heat, based on the environment, based on the chemical starting blocks. 
all of the factors are in place around hydrothermal vents to potentially the therm and the thermodynamics of the chemical reactions work so that they would step one chemical reaction on another to create all the all the possible parts needed to create something living. Now, there's a researcher, David Deemer, who's at, uh, I think it's UC San Diego, or no, UC Santa Cruz, who, provo who proposed hot springs, this volcanic hot spring hypothesis for uh, the origin of life years ago. And according to the scientist, he says the paper is impressive. Particularly significant is that their argument is based firmly on thermodynamic principles that revealed how molecular hydrogen in solution could act as the reducing agent to drive multiple reactions related to metabolism. And what's not yet addressed is how the reactions were encapsulated in some form of compartment. So, so that's the big question. You, you mentioned a clay or a mud, and that's another hypothesis that's been out there that maybe there maybe there are clay if there are if there are sponge-like compartments near these or sponges no there wouldn't have been sponges well, it's, yeah, yeah it's got you got to go back before the sponge that's the you got to go back before the, but if the, be, the clay had but compartments mud. yeah yeah uh, bubbles uh, you, uh, something bubbles. that made bubbles in mud bubbles and in you mud? got your yeah. compartments your, your cell walls and you can have your little chemical reactions yeah, yeah, yeah. I got something you said was, uh, oh, it's got the right conditions for metabolism. Oh, that sounds great. Wait, wait, wait. Back up. We got to start with, we got to start with just DNA. We got to start with uh, something that's replicating. We got to start with, where do you even get that machine? How does this, what starts before the, I don't understand still what has to come first. But I guess, uh, I guess it's, it doesn't have to necessarily be an intentional process. Exactly. Meaning life it's, is it's not very going like to be not not intentional. Right, right. Just right. And and you try to start that way because chemistry. When you back engineer and want to re-engineer, like you have an intentional goal. You want to get from here to here to here to here. So you got to put this thing, and then we got to have this component. But this works with this. So how if these fit together so perfectly? How could they have just happened to be? Because they they weren't nothing was designed. Things worked together because eventually things did. And that's kind and of you just can it. imagine. There are some chemical components in in chemical systems. We call some some uh, some molecules Chemistry scavengers all the way down. Yeah, we've got scavengers. And could you imagine the chemical processes that one chemical process is scavenging the uh, the energy? from another chemical process it's scavenging uh, one thing from another and eventually that scavenging turns into something that needs to be replicated and the molecules start to align in a particular way and processes can happen in a repeated pro in a repeated way um and yeah this idea as bradley white is is saying in the chat abiogenesis yeah where life came just from the stuff that was. Hmm. Luck of the draw, all the right things in the right place. But I think at the end of the day, it makes, you know, makes for a merry twistmas. Life, it finds a way. Yeah, those are some words. Also, uh, the chemical reactions uh, that we're talking about, aren't going to be completely unique to one planet in our universe and our galaxy even there's nope. going to be plenty of planets that have the similar chemistry that have the similar thermo events uh, maybe even have similar uh, size and amounts of water and all those things that we think are cr crucial in this instance and there may be other ways. It might be the thermal vents here could be the the muck ponds of uh, another planet. It could be something that happens in a dry space. It's a very they say humid here environment. That all, yeah, they say here though the the key factor to these processes happening here it's hydrogen. If you take hydrogen out, nothing works. Oh gosh, and what's the most uh, abundant element in the universe? 
Hmm. Hydrogen. There you go. There you go. Hydrogen. Everywhere. everywhere. Oh, yeah. Life's yes. going to be everywhere out there. It is. It Does is. it have a sense of humor? Have we done it? I think so. We made it to the end of another episode. Yeah. Our very, very special Twistmas episode. You know, every episode is special. But this week, we're celebrating all the science saying thank you all for being here. Um, there was one Twistmas, 2014, I believe, episode 494, when Justin's disclaimer read, "'Twas the night before Twistmas, when all through the house, no science was stirring, not even a mouse. The stories were laid by the webcam with care, in hopes that the minions soon would be there. Blair was already hiding her bed while visions of peacock spiders danced in her head. And Kiki in her lab coat and I on the moon, preparing our brains to bring the show soon. When all of a sudden, there arose such a clatter. So to the chat room, I sprang to see what just what was the matter. The minions were there and the minions were ready for the show to begin and the news to come steady, I opened a window and I saw with surprise that the Google Hangout was going, about to be live. I looked for my invite. I found it in text, just in time for this week in science. Coming up week after next. It's going to be week after next is our next episode, December 29th for our top 11 science stories of the year. Yeah, that's a, my, one of my favorite shows. So the, we recap all the great science. That was a great disclaimer. I should have done that one today. <laughs> Instead of that <laughs> god-awful thing that I was trying. Oh, it was fantastic. I think we should try and do it again in the after show. Oh, no. Let's do it again. Do it again. Do it again. I, can, I don't think I can do it. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so next week is the top 11. No. Uh, next week is our week off. We Twist is taking a we're week. Taking a week off. We're taking a week Why off. Why do we do that? That's insane. <laughs> you Nobody always takes ask. a week off. Well, it's one night to some. It's a, a week. It's a week in between, but the 29th, we're coming back with our top 11 science stories show. If you would like to uh, let us know what stories you think should be in the top 11, please do email or you can uh, you can hashtag us on Twitter with twists top 11 and we will be able to. Uh, be able to see your recommendations. Yes. No peacocks, no peacocks got spiders this year. I don't think we had any peacock spider stories in 2021. Which stories will make our final countdown? Oh, the tension is rising. You have two weeks before we tell you. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. All right, I think I already know what mine are. But now we have come to the end of our episode. So I just want to say thank you so much for listening. And I hope you did enjoy this show. Shout outs, shout outs, shout outs, shout, shout out. Fada, thank you for your help on the social medias and for show notes and all the other things you do. Gord, thank you for manning the chat, the chat rooms and Identity4. Thank you for recording the show. Rachel, thank you for editing and for other assistance that you give. And I definitely would like to thank our Patreon sponsors. Let's see if I can get them showing up here where everyone can see them. Thank you to Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Pierre Velazard, Ralph E. Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Andre Bissett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard, Chef Dad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Styles. AKA Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Maddie Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Don Munda, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Sean and Neil Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflo, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, AKA Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Friend Minish, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Railsback, Rummy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, RDM, Greg Briggs, 
John Atwood, hey, is there Arizona support Aaron Lieberman for governor? Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Mallory Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapo, Sarah Chavez, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul, Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Piccaro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support of Twists on Patreon. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. On next week's show, there's no show on December 29th show. We will be back on a Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time or a Thursday, 5 a.m. Central European time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Want to listen to us as a podcast? Because this is what we do. We podcast. Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe to. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for a newsletter if that's your thing. Oh, yeah. You can contact us directly. Email me, Kirsten, at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair, Blair Baz at Twist.org. One of these days, I will give everybody the same uh, email address domain. Just put Twist in the subject line so your email doesn't get spam filtered into a hydrothermal vent and spawn respawn life or a guinea worm yeah. we'll be back uh next uh oh wait no that's not the one you can also hit us up on the twitter where we are at twist science at dr kiki and jackson fly and at blair's menagerie we love your feedback if there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview a haiku that comes to you tonight please let us know and we will be back here December 29th. That's so tough. For our last show of the year, top 11 science stories of the year. We hope that you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. <laughs> this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be me. May not represent your views. Done the calculations. Oh, yeah. Oh, hello, hello, we hello. Ooh, what? We made it just in time for the show. Yeah. Wait, oh, what? Wait, time to start the show. Greyhound Day. Merry Greyhound Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Look at all the snow. It's the snowing. It's a blizzard going on here. It's our after show now. Yeah. Yeah. Da, nice. da, da. So Thank nice you for out. joining us for this episode of Twist. We are very glad that you have joined us for the show yeah. this week, this year, this decade, this decade. So there's been a whole decade. It's true. Yeah. It is true. I'm not driving angry. What? Yay! Eric got a calendar. Woohoo. Nice. Everyone who has gotten calendars, 
Glad you got your calendar. I did a mailing. I got them out. I'm glad, Eric, that you got your calendar. I, I still have some more to mail out. I have gotten a few more orders. All right, Anthony, you got your calendar. Everyone hmm. out there I getting still haven't calendars. Mine. You need to give me an address in Denmark. <laughs> It'll probably take a month. <laughs> it's not on the moon. It's, <laughs> like airplanes go everywhere, Kiki. It's, it mail is pretty quick. I don't want to take that one. It was a gift. Yay. Wonderful. Airplanes do go everywhere, but mail recently takes a long time. I'm not in sure. Ah, yes, a week off. It's on the calendar, our calendar. If you have the 2021 twist calendar and you look at the calendar for next Wednesday, it says no live show, Twistmas holiday. Mm. So tonight was our Twistmas show. The 29th will be our year in review show which is okay i have a question going what to day... be a lot of fun what day is it right now oh okay that's why right. i'm in a different i'm in a different <laughs> are you because you're thursday yeah my shows are on thursdays now so yes five uh, in the morning on thursdays you just... okay so wednesday 2021 the 22nd is what we're taking off is that right it's the 22nd here, which would be 5 a.m. on the 23rd for you. Will not oh, happen. Gosh. Uh, it's like two weeks of no show then. Uh, what? So yeah. No. It's almost. No. Mm -hmm. Why, why is it, calendar so hard? It's how it works. <laughs> there's all of this week till that show. Yeah. Right? And that's it. And then there's a whole nother week till there's another show. Oh. It's two weeks off. Nobody needs that much time away from this show. Are you sure about that? I'm pretty sure that's how math works. <laughs> calendar math is different. By the way, calendar math is different than other math. Oh, Flying Out got his calendar, but Kai didn't sign the envelope this year. Yeah, he was, in, he was actually in school. So he didn't help me pack things when I was packing them. Bah! That's just, I just, I'm going to say it's just one week off because it's one episode. I'm not going to, I don't want to talk about the math of it being two episodes. It's just going to make not people two sad. two episodes. It's one episode, but it's, it's one two one episode. Weeks. It's going to make people sad. Don't say two, two weeks. Two weeks without, without twist. No. It's just, just, just one yeah. episode. That's all. Just one episode. That's all. Calendar math is very special. <laughs> yes, Gord. <laughs> yeah. It's not Calendar the same. math. This special oh, math. Damn. Yeah, don't don't drink the eggnog and drive, everyone. This don't holiday drink eggnog. season. That's so disgusting. I found some, and I don't. This might be disgusting to other people. I found um, eggnog flavored oat That's milk. Disgusting. Oh god. So oh, it was. Oh, it's oat milk. So it's not okay. really milk. So it's not super thick. It's like. And you don't really call oat milk it's milk not. because, like, how do you milk an oat? It's like, I mean, really, like, what is oat milk when you think about it? It's like a oat solution, an oat excretion. Because you're not like, and it's not oat juice either, because you're not, it's not like you're. Juicy, <laughs> squeezing a bunch of oats to get the milk out of it. <laughs> Merry Twistmas, Fada. Have a wonderful, wonderful Twistmas. Yeah, and I know it's a week late uh, after the end of Hanukkah, but happy Hanukkah to all who cel celebrate Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy all of the holidays. This is a special time of year, I think. Regardless of your faith or lack thereof, the darkness is something that makes us turn to the light, makes us shelter, makes us seek company, makes us, you know, want to cozy up and find the people we know and the people we love and the people we like to spend time with. And 
So I, I, I wish for everyone to be able to have good times with others safely. We can do it. We can do it well. We can get through this holiday for show. Sure. You're going to have a good holiday in Denmark, huh, Justin? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, it's the same thing here. The Omicron, uh, Percy, I ate the disease is uh, spreading over, over here like uh, crazy. But, uh, yeah, I got the uh, got a tree. Went Don't burn hunted, the house down. Went and hunted, the, <laughs> hunted down a tree. Uh, and uh, been, uh, yeah, getting ready for the christmas and new year's which is a big big uh big holiday it's like the biggest holiday it's i think it's bigger than christmas here is new year's it's interesting because new year's it has been like a big holiday for several years for me and it's like last year and this year i'm kind of like yeah okay is it just turning 2020 now <laughs> again can we have a do-over? I don't think I want to do this year, uh, last year over. No, uh, oh, yeah, no. There have been lots of wonderful things that have happened for many people, but many bad things out there. And uh, what is that Apache vulnerability that Rick Lo Loveman is asking about? Does mine have? I don't know. You're reading random comments now. It's so, a it's a I mean, random easy. like this is not a random comment. Rick Loveman comes to the show all the time, so it's not totally it's random, but I don't understand. I'm I uh hope my website does not, but it might. It probably does. I don't know. It's a managed server, so hopefully the manager manage the server manager IT people will update things appropriately. Ah, or not. You know, like not. every once in a while, you need to just tear down a website and start all over again. We've done it a few, a few times. Now. <laughs> no, we only did it once. Okay. I've thought about tearing down the twist site previously. I still think about it occasionally. Uh -huh. I think I just want it to work <laughs> for people to find it. What did you do for your birthday? Uh, uh Cleaned. Yeah. You cleaned? Yeah. Uh, so um, the plan on my birthday was to, I was going to go uh, hunt a Christmas tree at this. Mm. Oh my gosh. Uh, the, oh, the, the most the picturesque snow filled Christmas tree farm uh, with a bunch of oldie time barn buildings and stuff. It was fantastic. It was an amazing place to go Christmas tree hunting. And chop it's down, so you know, you go, you pick it out, wander around this forest, and you cut it down, and you drag the tree back, and then uh, some proper lumberjacks uh, help you get it into your car. Right. <laughs> uh, but I uh, was going to do that on my birthday, and then realize there's like no place to put a tree. And you start moving things, you're like, all right, this has got to move out of the way for the tree. And then, oh, wait, now I can't uh, use that door because I put the thing in front of it. So you take that and you go to put that in storage and then you get down to the storage of, oh, okay, now I got all this stuff in storage already. I got to get rid of some of it. So you take some of that out, you bring it back into the apartment. And then you, by, by the end of it, it was like a whole day of, of just reorganizing the, the way humans interact with an uh, apartment based on this tree taking over. Yep. A uh, bunch of space. So uh, that ended up taking up enough of that day, along with, I think, some bread making and cookie baking. That, took that place. sounds like nice birthday stuff. Oh, it was. It was fine. And then the next day, I went out and uh, got a tree. So good birthday. Clean. Prepare for the tree. It's not yeah. cleaning. It's preparation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it was. And then made a big mess. Made a huge mess. <laughs> uh getting the tree and uh we, you put the what do you call them the, the little fake planets that you put all over the tree the ornaments you're up there now <laughs> and uh 
So yeah, now there's all these boxes where the ornaments were that I need to get put away still. But uh, yeah, it's looking very Christmassy all of a sudden. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, yeah, it is. I like the I like the the celebratory, the preparatory, the decorative, all the stuff. Yeah. The hat wearing. Hat wearing is fun. Hat wearing. I've got my Christmas tree earrings. Oh, nice. I didn't notice this before. Oh, those are little, cool. They, got, they have little planets on them. Yeah. <laughs> planets called ornaments. Yeah. I like it. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. But uh, yeah, everything everything's very Christmassy. Uh, the, the Danes know Christmas well, I think. Uh, very it into it. Is it how? What time is the sun going down there? It, it's actually yeah. It's uh, it's get, still getting darker uh, earlier. We got a, another week. Yeah. And then it'll just start getting uh, lighter a little bit uh, more each day. Yeah, it's a it's a fairly it's a fairly okay. It's seven a.m. It's pitch black outside is it it's still dark it's pitch black yeah. out there it will be yeah. probably i think for another hour um at least maybe more and then and then yeah usually by about 3 30 3 45 the sun Ooh. goes down three wow yeah it's and, going down here at like 4 30 and i thought that was early but yeah and then and then yeah. it, 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 if it's an overcast day it can be very overcast and this you might never see sun or light yeah <laughs> from the uh conversely though when it's summertime the it's like spring weather and the sun is out till like 11 o'clock at night or something crazy yeah so you have very long, long days. So you, so your your latitude is a bit is still northward of Portland. Yeah, so probably more probably more equivalent to Vancouver, Canada. Yeah, one of the things that what is it? Uh, London is as far north as Juneau, Alaska. I think it is. What? Yeah, yeah. I think I think we talked about that before. That just yeah. What? Yeah. So uh, all of Europe is much dark. further north than uh, Americans tend to think of it, and so Denmark is eh, you know I think a little bit further north than London. Actually, probably not that much further north, to be honest. But it's a little further north. Yeah. So yeah, your your sunrise was forty five minutes is is at eight thirty four a.m. So forty five minutes after. Yeah. The sunrise that I have here, and then your sun goes down at three thirty, huh? and ours oh. goes down at yeah three forty-five, and ours goes down at four thirty. Yeah. Oi, that's dark. Mm hmm. Yeah, three. Yeah, it's all sorts of maps are weird. Like yeah, like uh, what is it? Uh, Lake Tahoe is west of Los Angeles. Yes. And that confuses everybody in California who <laughs> lived in that state for forever. And you ask any Californian that, and they're like, that can't be right. It's just the way it is. It's the way it is. But you uh, learn also, your longitude and latitudes. But that's also sort of the fear of the global warming thing with the Atlantic Ocean conveyor belt is how far north Europe actually is. Yep. Uh, if they don't get that tropical conveyor belt of warming coming up to keep things nice and warm, that should all really have, be much colder than it is. But, you know, the, Alaska or, um, yeah, I think Alaska, it's the hottest that it's been. What was the, the Arctic? The Arctic, it's the hottest temperature recorded in November or December recently. All the temperatures are going up. So, hey, just good news. It's getting warmer in Northern Europe, too, probably, for at least a little while until that ocean current brings the cold water and the, the ice. <sighs> you don't look happy. You're like, no. 
So somebody's uh, somebody's asking, what is the parallel? What is, what parallel is Denmark on? Uh, according to this, Zero. I think it's the fifty fifth okay. uh, northern parallel. Parallel north fifty five. The border between uh, Canada and the USA is forty nine. Yes. So Denmark and there's a forty eighth parallel that I drive past. I think oh. it's between Salem and Portland. There's a sign okay. that's that notes passing a parallel at some point. I think it's the forty eighth. Parallel. I think it's the 48th in Oregon. That would make sense. 49th, uh, if 49th is the border between Canada and USA, a little bit down from there. Mm -hmm. What parallel? Uh, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. So Oregon is on the 45th parallel. That's what oh. it is. Oh, the 45th parallel. parallel forms some boundaries of or passes through many U.S. states, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, as well as going through Canadian provinces of Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Okay, so the 49th parallel. Let's see about that one. What does it cross? Ugh. I really need to update my computer, but I can't because it's old. <laughs> I can't, and I can't update my computer, so I can't update my Chrome browser. So I can't look these things up. Makes me sad. <sighs> The city of Paris is about 15 kilometers south of the 49th parallel. Yeah. Uh, who thinks of lovely Paris as being, you know, uh, as far north as Montana? Yeah. yeah. Canada. Which parallel mm -hmm. runs through, just ask the Google, Denmark? 55. 55th. Oh, there's a there is a small m memorial at fifty degree fifty five degrees north fifteen degrees east at the island of Bornholm. Mm -hmm. So if you want an outing, Justin, you could go find the fifty fifth parallel memorial. Memorial. <laughs> memorial on the island of Bornholm. I've been to Bornholm. It's a nice island. It's a little ways from here. You actually kind of have to go to Sweden to get the the boat to. Sounds about right. It's off there, out in the. It's uh, east. It's a little ways east, I guess. Yeah. East. But uh, yeah, uh, that's the island. I kept circling around trying to find a place that uh, had had uh, fish that wasn't smoked. Oh yes. <laughs> but apparently, the island is famous for its smoked uh, fish. Everywhere they sell smoked fish there. Also, it's one of the oldest breweries. Uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So are you are you avoiding fish or just not eating the smoked fish? Just not a big fan. <laughs> she said last fish. week. Like, just oh. not a big fan of the smoked fish. Yeah. I didn't go with a new MacBook Pro. I have a new, I think it's an Acer, no, a Razer. I have a Razer laptop, but I just haven't transferred everything over from my Mac to the Razer because of the Mac to PC change. And Yeah, it's not worth it. <laughs> It'll be fine. It's just no, it's, a, not gonna work. it's just a process. It, I have to go make sure I have all the programs on the computer that I need. None of it's I have to get work. all the passwords. Blah, 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 blah. It's just sitting down. I haven't It'll emptied my work. voicemail. I don't I there are things I don't do because they take two seconds, and that is just too long. <laughs> now nah, you think it's gonna take two seconds. The problem then you go in is oh, I gotta recover a password, and then oh, what's the email I used 20 years ago to start this account? And then do I have access? Oh, I got to get the password to that. And it wants a phone number. I got to go 
climb a telephone pole and get a landline to get, accept a phone call from a, it's just a whole it's a scavenger hunt i have yeah. to yeah it's like a, you've got to invest like two weeks at least uh into this project well yeah i mean that's where my brain goes is that oh this is going to take a long time and so i put it off and put it off and put it off maybe it'll be the thing that i can tackle over the next two weeks yeah, maybe. I'm not doing And that. I got to find it. I got to find a new microphone is what we've been to saying because I can't unless I do the show. That microphone sounds great. Right into but I have to be like right this. Right in there. Yeah. To where Oh, can you see the reflection of the light that's from the thing saying <laughs> it's on? If I don't have that reflection on my nose, I'm too far away from the microphone. It doesn't take very much for it to just, Yeah, and then you're back there, and then it's here. echoey, and mm -hmm. yeah, up so there. So I gotta have it like And, you're, and the, it this. just sounds so much warmer when you're up close. Oh, that's nice. Oh, it's just a nice, nice uh, microphone. I should sound. probably, like, yeah, I, I do need, like, a mic stand, and I think uh, maybe a different mic, maybe. Maybe this mic's okay. Maybe it just needs the stand. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, and just do it like a proper show. I mean, the show—it should be a radio show style thing. I don't know this whole and and nobody needs to see my face anymore. Like, I should really be doing the show like this. That's and great. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it should just be about the sound quality. It should be about the sound. Nothing to do with visual. I should just get a stand that I'll sit. Because uh, the other thing is where the mic, is, mic where the camera right. is. It's far back enough that I uh, I do need a stand. If the camera's going to be there, I do need a stand that can be like up. Yeah. I have something in a storage unit in a town called Davis, California. That would work. Well, no that is not in Denmark. But there is this. No, what am I? There is this thing about? called Amazon that ships. Oh, oh to no, it doesn't. Countries. Oh no, it doesn't. Nope, doesn't ship to allowed. Denmark. No, no, can't get Amazon Denmark. Well, cool. What? There is. Uh, people don't realize this. There is a. There's different Amazons. Well, there there's are also stores Amazon. that ship to other countries. There's a so uh, UK. Hang on. There's a UK Amazon. Yes, exactly. There's a you German Amazon. Yeah. There's no Go Denmark Danish. or Scandinavia Amazon, which also means because they that, have IKEA. No, I don't. Know. Because they already, uh, <laughs> because anything that you send into Denmark has uh, extra taxes, import taxes that can be applied. Nice. Which, yeah, uh, they look. They don't have people on rocket ships. Uh, billionaires on rocket ships giving tours to their besties, but they do provide extensive uh, maternal leave to every mother and baby. And prenatal care and postnatal care and all of that it's stuff. Pretty great. I mean, there's. <sighs> it turns out to have a really uh, wealthy nation is completely meaningless. If all of that wealth is in the hands of very few of the people that live there. If you have a well-distributed wealth system in a country, turns out it's great for everybody. Then people, like, the, it's just so funny. Like, all of the, the, uh, the experience of, like, seeing the, the difference between. Oh, I like sweet water. Dispersed. In, I, I do and I don't. Uh. I, I I absolutely have had good experiences with Sweetwater, but oh my goodness, I've been ordering stuff and it's been getting delayed. Well, uh, yeah, it would get delayed. I'm sure there are. But that's the that's the whole thing that's going on everywhere. That's right what's now. happening right now, exactly. Yeah. I do like a Sweetwater. Uh, also, there's the uh... yeah, but I don't know if I can get things direct here from that. Right, that's what I I don't know if Sweetwater can deliver to Denmark. I mean, you could. Yeah. Pop, international postage, which might be a bit, but I'm sure there's something that could be more local. Uh, if I'm just looking for a stand, I can figure something. If you just if you're getting a stand, I could I I can I can reimburse you for a stand. Okay. Make that happen. If you find one that you think will work, let me know. 
Yeah. I'll uh I'll go uh check out some music store things I think I can get delivered from. I think I've done that before here. So yeah, I should be okay. <laughs> You're like, I think I can do these things. Very possibly. Yeah, I mean the microphone sounds good. It looks pretty. It's just big and bulky. It's just a matter of Well, the other problem with it is What if you kind of that... put it to the side a little bit? Does it still yeah, like there? Uh like this? Yeah. So exactly. if you like well, I'm, I talk out of the side of my mouth anyway. So is it on the wrong, right? So uh, I talk over here on this side of the mouth. I could put it over here. Or talk over yeah, this but side it, you don't have to have it right in front of your face. You can if you want to. I feel like I mean, it's at one point you were doing the show with a sock puppet. So. Oh gosh, yeah, that was like the <laughs> very first video show. It's like I'm not going to be in front of the camera. Uh, I'll put a little sock puppet in front of the camera. When well, not even one that was being operated. It was just going to. Stare at the camera. Oh, it was your attempt at syphil and Ollie, I think. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think like the mic works great if you can get it kind of just get the placement right. And it can be in front of your face or it can be to the side slightly. The, the as long as it's closer to you. Is closer. The- yeah. Uh, lightning rod brings up as it was that the largest tornado in recorded human history that tore through the United States. Oh, I it does seem to have the longest track ever recorded. If it, and I don't yeah. know if they ever determined if it was one, uh, that one tornado was continuously a tornado or if it stopped and started and was other tornadoes or what have you. But, uh, well, you can really see the problem. Like I, I, every once in a while, somebody who's not familiar with tornadoes will ask a question: Why can't you just build houses that are tornado proof? And very I think, hard. I think you could do a better job than we do. Part of the yes. problem is it's more expensive, much more expensive, mm-hmm. probably, and. You know, that town that, that got the, what is it, Mayfield or whatever it was, that got completely leveled, has been in the Tornado Alley for hundreds of years. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it in have, Tornado Alley, but the, the probability of, yeah, yeah it's like the probability of being hit. there. Yeah. But then when you are hit, you're hit, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the other problem is, it's not just how strong you make a building. You also got to make it, you know. Uh, missile proof because there's going to be maybe cars picked up and slammed into your building. There's going to be debris. Somebody's roof or somebody's mobile home is going to be airborne for a while and slam into a house. But yeah, it would be kind of expensive. Uh, But yeah, you could. You could make them. There are, I mean, and there are um, universities who are actually studying building materials and building technologies and strategies to see how we can create more hurricane proof, tornado proof, earthquake earthquake proof buildings. There are like this is an active area of engineering science. Um I was in Gainesville, Florida. I think it was Gainesville for at University of Gaines Gainesville University of Florida Gainesville I think that's where it was um but they had a whole building set aside where they had a wind tunnel that they would put things in and they had a shaker where they would build it's like (laughs) it's like building a Lincoln log house and then on top of this this shaking platform and then they would like simulate earthquakes or they would blow wind through the wind tunnel and they like so they had all these ways to simulate these forces that would affect houses or commercial buildings and Mm. pretty awesome i mean that if you're going to do structural engineering that would be a pretty fun thing to do let's let's build a house and then see if we can shake it (laughs) and shake it and break it yeah so but in california they got those machines but you can't put a full house there they they only have time for you to build a small thing and then remove it so, yeah. you know, you might try a different structure of support the thingy or whatever, or a different design there and see if that how that works out. But it's usually small elements. They, uh, these things got to get thrown on there and pulled off again. And 
Oh gosh. But oh, you know the other thing I noticed with that little town that got knocked down had like four churches that had these huge church buildings and nice amphitheaters and everything. People must the, the town had like a population of like ten thousand people. Yeah. But they had four what well, looked like really decent sized churches. They had their own building, real estate, a cathedral y thing where you people go in there and they watch the 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 church show <laughs> on Sundays. That's uh that's some uh, that's I thought found that very fascinating. Because I'm like, we've got probably more people who listen to this show on a weekly basis than they have going to their churches. Mm -hmm. Where's our Twist headquarters building? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, where's, how come we don't have a Twist Cathedral studio built? I figure these people must be given pretty decent tribute. Because we don't ask for tithes, maybe? That's what we need to start doing. We need to get tax tithes. And <laughs> the twist, the twist 10% tithing. of your income should always go to twist. But yeah, oh, I was like, so for such a small town to have wow. such four, four of them, at least. Big mega churches. Big yeah. church looking things in a town of 10,000 people. I do not want twist to be a church. No, we are not. <laughs> I think we should. And the other thing, though, is the other thing is uh, people were uh, offering their thoughts and prayers to the people of the town. And I thought, you know, they already had four churches in a town of ten thousand. If prayers were going to help, I don't think that hurricane would have, would have, or tornado would have, would have hit the town in the first place. (laughs) Seems like with four churches and only ten thousand, you'd think every you'd be covered having the prayers going on there, but. So, okay, let's see. So an article on Kentucky.com uh, has said preliminary assessments by the National Weather Service show the tornado peaked at EF3 wind speeds, which ranges from 136 to 165 miles per that hour. Bad. That's the peak? Doesn't seem, I mean, that's a bad, that's a high wind. That can't be right. That can't be a tornado wind, can it? Yeah, that was in Bowling Green. That's okay. one long track tornado in Bowling Green. Um, there was another in, yeah, the long long track Western Kentucky tornado. They're still figuring everything out. Um, surveyors believe the twister traveled to 128 miles in Kentucky, moving along the ground at speeds of roughly 60 miles per hour. With um, and also also with wind speeds ranging from 158 to 206 miles per hour, putting it anywhere between EF3 and an EF5 on the enhanced Vegeta scale. Ooh, enhanced Vegetas. Yeah, it had a maximum width of three fourths of a mile, and um, it's possible Governor Andy Bashar Bashir previously reported the tornado traveled 227 miles across multiple states. And if that's true, it would break a 96 year old record for the longest continuous distance traveled by a tornado. Bam. (laughs) Yeah. So that's one of them. And the thing is that there were multiple tornadoes. There's one tornado had that had a huge long track, but then there were other tornadoes that also almost 40 of them. Yeah, it was like like all over the place. All over. I will not be moving to Kentucky anytime soon. Um, No, but that wasn't going to be a plan anyway. It's not like tornadoes put you off of that plan. Like, oh, tornadoes. Now I was all set to move to Kentucky, and uh, right where middle where everything good is going on in the world. uh, Although probably not that much bad is happening. Hmm. Uh, Kentucky. Got to Got to see a map here for a second. Where I haven't looked at my Okay. So that's Arkansas is not really in 
Is that in, it's not, is that in Tornado Alley? What is Tornado Alley? Which states are included in Tornado Alley? Ah, Arkansas, South Dakota, Iowa, Gotta Nebraska. Be Kansas. Kansas. Gotta be Kansas. Has to be Kansas. Mm. Those little red shoes. The one I know. <laughs> Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Texas. Central Plains and Southern states. Oh, Illinois got hit. That was where the uh, Amazon factory was. Yeah. That's pretty so far north, actually. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. But, you know, it's not related to climate change, so. <laughs> Eric, you'll take earthquakes and volcanoes any day of the week. Yeah, I, I, I think I might too. I don't know. It's interesting. People, people pick different risks, right? You, some people are fine with the possible possibility of tornadoes. You have a basement. You can go shelter during tornado season. Other people are fine with the preeminent risk of an earthquake or a volcanic e eruption. Some people yeah. don't even think about it at all. Other people go to places like Arizona and don't think about impending drought and water scarcity. I mean, there, we have all these different mm -hmm. risks and we don't really consider any of them. I don't know. Is Nebraska really a state? <laughs> yeah. I, I, come on. I mean that quite sincerely. Like, what? So talk about the, their mom about? grew up in Nebraska, smack in the middle of the tornado alley. I don't know where Nebraska is. Is that weird? I have no, like, I could not place Nebraska. That is the problem America. with with Americans. There oh, there it is. It's right dab <laughs> in the middle of the other states. In the I'm middle. not really sure of, like, rectangle states. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's well, Nebraska, huh? Oh, it's by uh, south you of the Dakotas. South of the Dakotas. Yes. Is when you get into Nebraska. You know, when you bring up the the state and it gives you, okay, you know, just put in Nebraska into the Google. I got two yeah. maps showing me where Nebraska is, meaning they knew that was going to be the first question. Where That's the what heck they is do Nebraska? with every state. Uh, they showed <laughs> a, a picture map. of some city, and then the next picture is a covered wagon. <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> the fourth image related to Nebraska. The first two are a map showing you where Nebraska is. The fourth oh. one is a covered wagon because uh, not much, not much has happened since apparently. Oh, wait a minute though. Atlas Obscura has something, has 40 cool and unusual things to do in Nebraska. Oh, that's got the, the car henge is in Nebraska. Oh, okay. I'm going to. I need to open this thing up for you. Hold on. Get you pictures of this. This, we're going to go to Nebraska because <laughs> I want to see this. <laughs> this is this has got to be like one of the things to do. Carhenge in Nebraska. It is a replica of Stonehenge. With cars. Yeah. Which sounds just weird and awesome. And I love people who do kind of weird artistic things. It's so great. There were a bunch of people who went to Carhenge for the um, for the eclipse that went across the United States a few oh, years yeah. back. Yeah. See. yeah. No light pollution. Exactly. <laughs> uh-huh it's kind of in the middle of nowhere yeah but car henge but yes atlas obscura has a list of many things there's a chimney rock toadstool geological park Ooh, ancient fossils nebraska has badlands nebraska also has the world's largest ball of stamps <laughs> okay this one <laughs> this one this one i love 
the highest point in Nebraska. <laughs> it's called Panorama Point. Uh, this highest point in Nebraska. How? Let's see. How? What is its altitude? Oh, oh come on! You're not going to tell me the altitude when you say it's the highest point. It's very Nebraska is very flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so is Denmark. Oh, okay. Panorama Point. In Nebraska is 5,429 feet elevated. That I did not expect. It's flat, but it's well above sea level. That's a fairly oh, high altitude. Yeah. Fascinating. Deep. Fascinating. See, you learn something every day. We just learned things about Nebraska. Don't you feel edified? <laughs> Oh, I think, I, uh, hang on now, hang on. It's, uh, oh. There is kitsch in all 50 states. I think a kitsch tour is, you know, if you're ever going around, you have to do a, a kitsch tour. I mean, a science tour and a kitsch tour, because that's very entertaining as you travel. All right, hang on a second. Okay, what are you finding? What was, uh, what was, the, what was the altitude above sea level there, or what do you call it? Panorama Point. Yeah, how high up was it? 5,429 feet. Oh, 5,000. Right. It's a very so whole, high I mean, altitude high plane. Plateau? Yeah, high plateau for sure. Okay. Yeah, so it is um it's that high because you've got uh the Rocky Mountains that come down on their eastern side in Colorado still at a fairly high altitude. And so that um this location is near the point where Nebraska and Wyoming meet on Colorado's northern boundary. So this is at a very, it is a place that is still, that's at a very high elevation. It hasn't tapered all the way down yet. Mm -hmm. Highest point Highest in Denmark is 566 feet above sea level. Woo! Get that altitude. You got real elevation. Right. Well, that's not the highest point. I think there's actually there's plenty of buildings in Denmark. I think they're much taller actually <laughs> than this mountain, or uh, much higher above sea level than this, this the tallest mountain, which that's I think great. they normally uh, refer to in its number of centimeters high because of the it it seems taller that way. But yeah, Denmark is very very flat. Very flat. It's very, very flat. And so the engineers in Denmark decided that they would show through human engineering prowess that they were able to create buildings taller than nature could build. <laughs> <That's> the mountains. <laughs> the mountains. Yeah. Right next door, you got you got your uh, Sweden and Norway. Plenty of mountains, more mountains, so many mountains. You can go mountain climbing all day if you want to. Denmark, no mountains, nice and flat. Ooh. Uh, yeah, Grouchy Gamer's talking about uh, poor Denmark when the uh, you know the uh, glaciers all melt and the sea level rises. Uh, interestingly, it's not the sea level is not really going to rise that much uh, in Scandinavia. It's going to be one of the least affected places on the planet. Uh, most of the water collection is going to happen equatorial. Most of the sea level rise is going to happen equ equatorially. Uh, part of that is because as the giant glaciers on the poles melt, Ground level for a large region will slowly rise. As weird as that sounds, it's the weight of that ice is actually compressing land that will uncompress to some degree. Yeah, they... and rise up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's going to be really interesting. I mean, just, just things are going to slightly shift over, you know, hundreds of years, but... 
you think of these kinds of changes as usually taking place over thousands, tens of thousands. Yeah. yeah hundreds uh, of thousands. And yet yeah. here we are like, oh, this could be like, you know, next century. Yes. Hundred yeah. years, and then we're gonna just see what happens. Let's go, humans! Look what we can do. <laughs> Best planetary engineers. Yeah, it's like the North Pole. Oh well, you know the glaciers of uh, Canada and Greenland and uh, whatever's going on in northern Russian ice mountainy stuff. North Pole region. It's much larger region, that Arctic Circle. It's pretty big. Very big. Yeah, Florida will be gone. Florida is going away. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that has been reiterated by many people. <laughs> now, it's the like, question nope, it's not going to be the there. The question is what happens to the, the, the Floridians, the people of Florida? Uh, do they move to neighboring states or do they become like water world people? Like, I, I think a lot of them are probably already pirates. Yeah. That's just sort of my picture of Florida is, is where all the pirates in the United States live. Uh, but, but some of them uh, may may actually adapt to get, have gills. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, but houses on stilts. Crossbreeding with the manatees. I mean, how long do you think it'll take? I mean, some people are going to move. Things are, are going to encroach too much. They're not. Their houses are going to be too close to the sea. Hurricanes are going to come and batter them. They're not going to like it. They're going to. Their jobs are going to suffer. Economy is going to suffer. Oh, I'm going to move out. But some people are going to be like, I like this. This is like cool. Yeah. Cool living, and they'll create you know tourist places or communities that are on stilts, and maybe they all live on boats. Yeah. Who knows what'll happen and how long it'll take. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to watch it happen. Yeah. yeah. The entire, but coastlines around the world are going to be experiencing so much. It's going to be different. So much. And people are going to move so much. But people adapt. Mm -hmm. We can We can abide. There will be struggle and strife, but Oh, yeah, as our as behavior. Florida, we can do can good abide. things. Do, uh, hey, you, you know, the real estate prices are pretty cheap in in Florida. <laughs> I wonder why. There might be a reason that the uh, hedge funds aren't investing heavily in your your real estate, Florida. You might want to look at why. Not so much anymore. Which is great. On one hand, because uh, you're not competing against Wall Street and the wealthy class do, buying up all your property. But right. on the other hand, there's Wall a reason Street. they're not buying it all up. You're not. If you're buying that property or nobody wants to buy your property, you haven't invested in generational wealth. No. No. It's quite the opposite. Stephen Rain says we should create floating islands. People, There are people trying to do that, create their... I mean, I think mostly they're crypto enthusiasts, but <laughs> what? Uh, offshore crypto <laughs> tax havens. I think Singapore <laughs> is 70 percent. Uh, gosh, that's a number in my head and I don't know if it's right. 70 percent uh, reclaimed from the sea. It's not floating. It's not right. floating. They've they've right. <laughs> they've filled Shorted sand up. from yeah. India into uh into uh their uh ocean and filled it up with uh, sand to build structures on yeah but it's 70 70 percent reclaimed already uh, mm. i just have to keep doing that you know one of the things i've seen i mean you can't do this everywhere downtown sacramento is a fantastic example uh city i, I kind of grew up in there for a while city of sacramento mm. downtown regions right along the river used to flood every once in a while and destroy the downtown of the city of the bustling city of Sacramento. So they raised the city like 15 feet. They said, we're done with this. They trucked in dirt from wherever they could get it and all over California. Right? 
brought it there, raised the downtown district. Forget just the levy. Let's raise all of downtown. Let's raise it up. They did. And it's fun because you can still see it if they demolish one of the older buildings in town. You can see storefronts. They just added the dirt in front of the storefronts and built a, a street, a story up. That's just, they're almost two stories up. This is what they did. They just said, forget it. So there's all these storefronts that are underground. There are all these first floors of uh, basements of buildings that were actually just the first floors of buildings. Yeah. When you go to the old town Sacramento and they left some of the original storefronts up there uh, where you can, you drive way down the alley, goes way down like a whole story and it comes back up again. Yeah. yeah. But, but you can only do that, you know, so many places and for so long before California is fine. Cause there's plenty of dirt. There's mountains, the Sierras, you're never going to run out of dirt in California. You could infill for forever. Uh, what are you going to do in Florida? You're going to pull water, <laughs> dirt from swamplands. You're creating, just creating more swampland. Yeah. And it's salty. So it's not going to make good farming good. topsoil. Hmm. They're the beaches of uh, Long Miami's coast. Uh, it's already fake. It's already uh, gets washed away and dredged up from out in the sea and sprayed back uh, up there to make beaches again. You already the beaches are already fake. They're already being washed away. I don't know if everybody realizes that. It's a bunch of change. Mm. But life, <laughs> we're lucky to be here life, to witness all of this amazingness. Mm. Yeah, it's never <laughs> and been to be witness to, be to our own destruction. <laughs> yeah, it's life never will been continue. Easy. I think the big take home is, you know, our time here could be short. It could be long. But regardless, mm. the principles of life abide and that the if the thermodynamics and the chemistry allow life will happen the kiki abides it abides i abide that's right the kiki abides the dude the dude i don't know you know i don't you know i don't know nihilism has a certain attraction but you know when it comes down to it you know it's like it's all it's all, it's all good. It's okay. I got to try and come back to these big, big picture perceptions mm -hmm. of things, not get tied up and bogged down in the negative details. And, you know, it's great to understand all this stuff. It's neat to learn more. It's neat. It's good for us to understand what we're doing and how we're doing it. We might or might not be on time to fix it. Hopefully we can fix it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For future generations, Denmark, the Scandinavian countries, Denmark specifically has much more of a long view where they have like a 100 year plan. They have a, they look like their planning is part of it has this century long perspective of like okay we're here now short term gains whatever but what are what's going to be happening in 100 years and how can we plan for that and how can we plan to to help future generations and that kind of perspective proactiveness i think is it's wonderful mm. i yeah i don't know well, maybe i don't know i don't know well you have a wonderful day. Has the sun yeah. come up yet? Oh yeah, yeah. no, it's still it's still an hour away. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> yeah in a hundred years, Denmark will be all that remains. Well, so so this is one of the things. Denmark in the past had. Uh, conquered or owned or was running most of Europe. It was down into Spain. It had the Britain. You had all the islands. You had uh, Denmark ruled much of the world at some point and then uh -huh, decided true. eh, not worth it. <laughs> yeah. And, no, thanks. Yeah. Denmark still has some interesting habits related to its past. Really? Uh. Everyone has a past. Yeah, everyone has a past, but it's one of those past. Like if you're talking about going back all the way to the Viking days, 
I tell you what happened in Denmark, it was probably a natural selection experiment, like the Foxtrot study, Foxtrot study, whatever it is. Right. They took all of the aggressive males and stuck them on boats and sent them away. Yep. And what's left is actually very peaceful people. <laughs> very, <laughs> very domestic. Very like, oh, it's, uh, do you want to go raid a thing? Nah, I think I'll put on a warm blanket over my legs, sit in this comfy chair and have some. Cocoa. It's time for some Higa. Yeah. Yeah. Higa. Yeah, it's Higa That's season. What we, need to do. we need to take all the aggressive people and let them go conquer Mars. <laughs> and, then, and then the planet will be fine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You, you go. You conquer Mars. Have fun with that. Yeah. You go do that. That's great. Bye. Fight those rocks. Bye. We'll give you some cliff bars and uh, some tang, and off you go. Yeah. Wee -wee. All right. Good night. Uh, say, uh, so what did you say? Say good night, Kiki. <laughs> no, wait. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Good night, Kiki. There we are. Good night, everyone. Thank you for some wonderful science time. We appreciate you being here. Have a wonderful, wonderful time between twist episodes. We hope you stay safe, stay healthy, take care of yourselves, and we will see you on December 29th. Ah, I don't think I have anything else going on before then. It's family time. Time to get Higa. All right. Thank you. We will see you soon. Merry Twistmas. Merry Twistmas.